hadith that gives us a glimpse into the life of the holy prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, upon him, upon him, upon him. his sunnah or tradition that is what he said did implemented and how he implemented collected from various books of ahadith, hadith, hadith, hadith such as the Bukhari and Muslim collections Muwatta of Imam Malik Sunan Tirmizi Abu Dawood among other renowned and trusted scholars of the prophet's narrations in addition to that we have included a brief biography of the companions of the Holy Prophet who are the best generation according to the Holy Prophet's assertion for us to emulate their sterling qualities piety and love for one another the hadith, the hadith of, the of the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad peace, peace be upon him, upon him. The family is the foundation of Islamic society. The peace and security offered by a stable family unit is greatly valued and seen as essential for the spiritual growth of its members. A harmonious social order is created by the existence of extended families. Children are treasured and rarely leave home until the time they marry. Parents are greatly respected in the Islamic tradition. Mothers are particularly honored. The Quran teaches that since mothers suffer during pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing, they deserve a special consideration and kindness. In Islam, the only legitimate way of getting children or becoming a parent is through marital relationship. In other words, marriage. According to Islam, marriage is a religious duty on all who are capable of meeting its responsibilities. Each member of the family has rights and obligations. A Muslim marriage is both a sacred act and a legal agreement in which either partner is free to include legitimate conditions. As a result, divorce, although uncommon, is permitted only as a last resort. Marriage customs vary widely from country to country. Narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, A woman who has been previously married is more entitled to her person than her guardian and a virgin must be asked for her consent for herself and her consent is her silence <laughs> narrated by abu huraira the messenger of allah may allah bless him and grant him peace said do not ask for a woman in marriage when another muslim has already done so <laughs> Narrated by Sahal ibn Sa'ad as Sa'idi, that a woman came to the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, and said, Messenger of Allah, I have given myself to you. She stood for a long time, and then a man got up and said, Messenger of Allah, marry her to me if you have no need of her. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, Do you have anything to give her as a bride prize? He said, I possess only this lower garment of mine. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, If you give it to her, you will not have a garment to wear, so look for something else. He said, I have nothing else. He said, Look for something else, even if it is only an iron ring. He looked and found that he had nothing. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, Do you know any of the Quran? He said, Yes, I know such and such a surah and such and such a surah, which he named. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said to him, I have married her to you for what you know of the Quran.
This gives us a glimpse into the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, his sunnah or tradition, that is what he said, did, implemented and how he implemented, collected from various books of ahadith such as the Bukhari and Muslim collections, Muatta of Imam Malik, Sunan Tirmizi, Abu Dawood among other renowned and trusted scholars of the Prophet's narrations. In addition to that, we have included a brief biography of the companions of the Holy Prophet, who are the best generation according to the Holy Prophet's assertion, for us to emulate their sterling qualities, piety and love for one another. The Hadith, the hadith of the of Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad peace be upon him. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through this phrase, millions of Muslims from the early history of Islam to the present have come to be familiar with the name Abu Huraira. In speeches and lectures, in Friday khutbas and seminars, in the books of Hadith and Seerah, Fiqh and Ibadah, the name Abu Huraira is mentioned in this fashion. On the authority of Abu Huraira, may God be pleased with him, who said, the Messenger of God, may God bless him and grant him peace, said. Through his prodigious efforts, hundreds of hadith or sayings of the Prophet were transmitted to later generations. His is the foremost name in the role of hadith transmitters. Next to him comes the names of such companions as Abdullah, the son of Umar, Anas, the son of Malik, Ummul Muminin Aisha, Jabir ibn Abdullah and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, all of whom transmitted over a thousand sayings of the Prophet. Abu Huraira became a Muslim at the hands of At-Tufayl ibn Amr, the chieftain of the Dawus tribe to which he belonged. The Dawus lived in the region of Tihama, which stretches along the coast of the Red Sea in the southern Arabia. When At-Tufayl returned to his village, after meeting the Prophet and becoming a Muslim in the early years of his mission, Abu Huraira was one of the first to respond to his call. He was unlike the majority of the Dawes who remained stubborn in their old beliefs for a long time. When At-Tufayl visited Mecca again, Abu Huraira accompanied him. There he had the honor and privilege of meeting the noble prophet, who asked him, What is your name? Abdu Shams, servant of a son, he replied. Instead, let it be Abdul Rahman, the servant of the beneficent Lord, said the prophet. Yes, Abdul Rahman, it shall be, O messenger of God, he replied. However, he continued to be known as Abu Huraira, the kitten man, literally the father of a kitten, because like the Prophet, he was fond of cats and since his childhood often had a cat to play with. Abu Huraira stayed in Tihama for several years and it was only at the beginning of the seventh year of the Hijra that he arrived in Medina with others of his tribe. The Prophet had gone on a campaign to Khaybar. Being destitute, Abu Huraira took up his place in the masjid with other of the Ahlus Sufa. He was single, without wife or child. With him, however, was his mother who was still a mushrik. He longed and prayed for her to become a Muslim, but she adamantly refused. One day, he invited her to have faith in God alone and follow his prophet, but she uttered some words about the prophet which saddened him greatly. With tears in his eyes, 
he went to the noble prophet who said to him, What makes you cry, Abu Abu Huraira? I have not let up in inviting my mother to Islam, but she has always rebuffed me. Today, I invited her again, and I heard words from her which I do not like. Allahumma. Do make supplication to God Almighty to make the heart of Abu Huraira's mother inclined to Islam. The Prophet responded to Abu Huraira's request and prayed for his mother. Abu Huraira said, I went home and found the door closed. I heard the splashing of water, and when I tried to enter, my mother said, Stay where you are, O Abu Huraira. And after putting on her clothes, she said, Enter. I entered and she said, I testify that there is no God but Allah, and I testify that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. I returned to the Prophet, peace be upon him, weeping with joy, just as an hour before I had gone weeping from sadness and said, I have good news, O Messenger of God. God has responded to your prayer and guided the mother of Abu Huraira to Islam. Abu Huraira loved the Prophet a great deal and found favor with him. He was never tired of looking at the Prophet whose face appeared to him as having all the radiance of the sun, and he was never tired of listening to him. Often he would praise God for his good fortune and say, Praise be to God who has guided Abu Huraira to Islam. Praise be to God who has taught Abu Huraira the Quran. Praise be to God who has bestowed on Abu Huraira the companionship of Muhammad May God bless him and grant him peace. On reaching Medina, Abu Huraira set his heart on attaining knowledge. Zayd ibn Thabit, the notable companion of the Prophet, reported, While Abu Huraira and I and another friend of mine were in the masjid praying to God Almighty and performing dhikr to him, the Messenger of God appeared. He came towards us and sat among us. He became silent and he said, Carry on with what you are doing. So my friend and I made a supplication to God before Abu Huraira did, and the Prophet began to say, Amin to our dua. Then Abu Huraira made a supplication saying, O Lord, I ask you for what my two companions have asked, and I ask you for knowledge which will not be forgotten. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Amin. We then said, And we ask Allah for knowledge which will not be forgotten. And the Prophet replied, The Dosi youth has asked for this before you. With this formidable memory, Abu Huraira set out to memorize in the four years that he spent with the Prophet the gems of wisdom that emanated from his lips. He realized that he had a great gift and he set about to use it to the full in the service of Islam. He had free time at his disposal. Unlike many of the Muhajireen, he did not busy himself in the marketplace with buying and selling. Unlike many of the Ansar, he had no land to cultivate, no crops to tend. He stayed with the Prophet in Medina and went with him on journeys and expeditions. Many companions were amazed at the number of hadith he had memorized and often questioned him on when he had heard a certain hadith and under what circumstances. Allahum. Once, Marwan ibn al-Hakam wanted to test Abu Huraira's power of memory. He sat with him in one room, and behind a curtain he placed a scribe, unknown to Abu Huraira, and ordered him to write down whatever Abu Huraira said. A year later, Marwan called Abu Huraira again and asked him to recall the same hadith which the scribe had recorded. It was found that he had forgotten not a single word. 
Abu Huraira was concerned to teach and transmit the ahadith he had memorized and knowledge of Islam in general. It is reported that one day he passed through the souk that is marketplace of Medina and naturally saw people engrossed in the business of buying and selling. How feeble are you, O people of Medina, he said. What do you see that is feeble in us, Abu Huraira? They asked. The inheritance of the Messenger of God, peace be on him, is being distributed, and you remain here? Won't you go and take your portion? Where is this, O Abu Huraira? they asked. In the masjid, he replied. Quickly they left. Abu Huraira waited until they returned. When they saw him, they said, O Abu Huraira, we went to the masjid and entered and we did not see anything being distributed. Didn't you see anyone in the masjid? He asked. Oh yes, we saw some people performing salat, some people reading the Quran, and some people discussing about what is halal and what is haram. Woe unto you, replied Abu Huraira. That is the inheritance of Muhammad. May God bless him and grant him peace. Abu Huraira underwent much hardship and difficulties as a result of his dedicated search for knowledge. He was often hungry and destitute. He said about himself, When I was afflicted with severe hunger, I would go to a companion of the Prophet and ask him about an ayah of the Quran and stay with him, learning it so that he would take me with him to his house and give me food. One day, my hunger became so severe that I placed a stone on my stomach. I then sat down in the path of the companions. Abu Bakr passed by and I asked him about an ayah of the Book of Allah. I only asked him so that he would invite me, but he didn't. Then Umar bin al-Khattab passed by me and I asked him about an ayah but he also did not invite me. Then the messenger of God, peace be on him, passed by and realized that I was hungry and said, Abu Huraira, at your command I replied and followed him until we entered his house. He found a bowl of milk and asked his family, from where did you get this? Someone sent it to you, they replied. He then said to me, O Abu Huraira, go to the Ahlu Sufa and invite them. Abu Huraira did as he was told, and they all drank from the milk. The time came, of course, when the Muslims were blessed with great wealth and material goodness of every description. Abu Huraira eventually got his share of wealth. Allah. He had a comfortable home a wife and child. But this turn of fortune did not change his personality. Neither did he forget his days of destitution. He would say, I grew up as an orphan and I emigrated as a poor and indigent person. I used to take food for my stomach from Busra into Gazwan. I served people when they returned from journeys and led their camels when they set out. Then God caused me to marry her, that is Busra. So praise be to God, who has strengthened his religion and made Abu Huraira an Imam. This last statement is a reference to the time when he became governor of Medina. Much of Abu Huraira's time would be spent in spiritual exercises and devotion to God. Qiyam al-Layl, staying up for the night in prayer and devotion, was a regular practice of his family, including his wife and his daughter. He would stay up for a third of the night, his wife for another third, and his daughter for a third. In this way, in the house of Abu Huraira, no hour of the night would pass without ibadah, dhikr, and salah. During the Caliphate of Umar, 
Umar appointed him as governor of Bahrain. Umar was very scrupulous about the type of persons whom he appointed as governors. He was always concerned that his governors should live simply and frugally and not acquire much wealth even though this was through lawful means. In Bahrain, Abu Huraira became quite rich. Umar heard of this and recalled him to Medina. Umar thought he had acquired his wealth through unlawful means and questioned him about where and how he had acquired such a fortune. Abu Huraira replied, From breeding horses and gifts which I received, hand it over to the treasury of the Muslims, ordered Umar. Abu Huraira did as he was told and raised his hands to the heavens and prayed, O Lord, forgive the Amir al muminin Subsequently, Umar asked him to become governor once again, but he declined. Umar asked him why he refused and he said, So that my honor would not be besmirched, my wealth taken and my back beaten. And he added, And I fear to judge without knowledge and speak without wisdom. Throughout his life, Abu Huraira remained kind and cautious to his mother. Whenever he wanted to leave home, he would stand at the door of her room and say, Assalamu alaikum ya ummata wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, meaning, Peace be on you, mother, and the mercy and blessings of God. She would reply, Wa alayka salam ya bunayya wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And on you be peace, my son, and the mercy and blessings of God. Often, he would also say, May God have mercy on you, as you cared for me when I was small. And she would reply, May God have mercy on you, as you delivered me from error when I was old. Allahumma Narrated by Anas ibn Malik, the Prophet peace be upon him said, None of you should wish for death because of a calamity befalling him. But if he has to wish for death, he should say, O oh Allah, keep me alive as long as life is better for me, and let me die if death is better for me. Narrated by Muhammad ibn Labid, the Prophet peace be upon him said, There are two things which the son of Adam dislikes. He dislikes death, but death is better for the believer than temptation. And he dislikes few possessions, but few possessions involve less reckoning. Narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah, Allah's Messenger peace be upon him said, Do not wish for death, for the terror of the place whence one looks down is severe. It is part of a man's happiness that his life should be long, and Allah who is great and glorious should supply him with repentance. <laughs> Narrated by Abu Huraira, Allah's Apostle peace be upon him informed the people about the death of an najashi on the very day he died. He went towards the Musalla that is the praying place and the people stood behind him in rows. He said four takbirs that is offered the funeral prayer. <laughs> Narrated by Ibn Abbas, 
A person died and Allah's apostle used to visit him. He died at night and the people buried him at night. In the morning they informed the Prophet peace be upon him about his death. He said, What prevented you from informing me? They replied, It was night and it was a dark night and so we dislike to trouble you. The Prophet peace be upon him went to his grave and offered the funeral prayer. Narrated by Ibn Abbas A man was crushed to death by his she-camel and was brought to Allah's apostle peace be upon him who said Give him a bath and shroud him but do not cover his head and do not bring any perfume near to him as he will be resurrected reciting Talbiyah Narrated by Zainab binti Abi Salama When the news of the death of Abu Sufyan reached from Sham, Umm Habiba on the third day asked for a yellow perfume and scented her cheeks and forearms and said, No doubt, I should not have been in need of this had I not heard the Prophet peace be upon him saying, It is not legal for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to mourn for more than three days for any dead person except her husband, for whom she should mourn for four months and ten days. Oh. Narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, I heard Allah's apostle peace be upon him saying, Allah does not take away the knowledge by taking it away from the hearts of the people, but takes it away by the death of the religious learned men, till when none of the religious learned men remains people will take as their leaders ignorant persons who when consulted would give their verdict without knowledge so they will go astray and will lead the people astray narrated by abdullah ibn umar allah's apostle peace be upon him said the finest act of goodness is the kind treatment of a person to the loved ones of his father after his death. Narrated by Amr ibn al-Harith, the Prophet peace be upon him did not leave anything behind him after his death except a white mule, his arms and a piece of land which he left to be given in charity. Narrated by Abu Malik al Ash'ari, Abu Malik had the Apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, say, He who goes forth in Allah's path and dies or is killed is a martyr, or has his neck broken through being thrown by his horse or by his camel, or is stung by a poisonous creature. O dies in his bed by any kind of death, Allah wishes is a martyr and will go to paradise. Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Umar. Umar, 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 Umar At Shaykhan, halfway between Medina and Uhud, the thousand strong Muslim army led by the Prophet stopped. The sun had begun to sink beneath the horizon. The Prophet dismounted from his horse. He was fully dressed for battle. A turban was round about his helmet. He wore a breastplate beneath which was a coat of mail which was fastened with a leather sword belt. A shield was slung across his back and his sword hung from his side. As the sun set, Bilal called the Adhan and they prayed. The Prophet peace be upon him then reviewed his troops once more and it was then that he noticed in their midst the presence of eight boys who despite their age were hoping to take part in the battle. Among them were Zaid's son, that is Usama, and Umar's son, Abdullah. 
both only 13 years old. The Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered them all to return home immediately. Two of the boys, one of which is Abdullah ibn Umar, however demonstrated that they were able fighters and were allowed to accompany the army to the Battle of Uhud, while the others were sent back to their families. From an early age, Abdullah ibn Umar thus demonstrated his keenness to be associated with the Prophet in all his undertakings. He had accepted Islam before he was 10 years old and had made the hijra with his father and his sister Hafsa, who was later to become a wife of the Prophet. Before Uhud, he was also turned away from the Battle of Badr and it was not until the Battle of the Ditch that he and Usama, both now 15 years old and others of their age, were allowed to join the ranks of the men, not only for the digging of the trench, but for the battle when it came. There are several days in the Muslim calendar with special religious significance, but the major celebrations common to all Muslims are the two Eid holidays. The first Eid day is celebrated on the day after the month of Ramadan, that is the Eid al-Fitr. The second is celebrated on the 10th day of the 12th Islamic month, Dhul Hijjah, which is known as Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Fitr means the festival of breaking the fast. The fast of Ramadan is broken with special prayers and festivities. Fitr is derived from the word fatar, meaning breaking. Another connotation suggests that it is derived from fitra, meaning arms. Certain Sunni Muslims believe that fitr comes from fitrat, meaning nature, and Eid al-Fitr is the celebration of God's magnanimity in providing nature to man. Celebrated on the first day of the new moon in Shawwal, it marks the end of Ramadan. The festivities include congregational prayer, gatherings with family and friends, and gifts and entertainment especially for children. More than 1.2 billion Muslims all over the world are celebrating today. In the morning, everyone takes a bath, wears new or clean clothes, applies perfume, and eats dates or some other sweet before walking to the mosque for the Eid prayers. Men wear white clothes because white symbolizes purity and austerity. The Eid special prayer is performed in the morning in the mosque. These prayers can be read any time between sunrise and just afternoon. Even women in veil attend the prayers in special chambers. It is the tradition of the Prophet peace be upon him to follow different paths to and from the mosque. He also used to recite this supplication on the way and after all the five daily prayers for the three days of Eid. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. On this day, according to the tradition of the Prophet, Allah has intended a dole for every Muslim who is free and is in possession of arms, worthy capital. It is to be given to a needy person as thanksgiving. The amount to be gifted must be in excess of one's essential needs and free from all encumbrances of debt. One sa'a, which is approximately equivalent to three kilograms of food, date or barley, is to be given as zakat al-fitr on every Muslim slave or free male or female, young or old, and that to be given before the people went out to offer the Eid prayer. The 30-day fast is broken on Eid al-Fitr with sumptuous feasts. The festival originated when after proclaiming Ramadan as the period of fasting and austerity, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him announced a day for celebrations to reaffirm the feeling of Eid al-Fitr brotherhood. Women prepare sweets, bakes, and fries at home. People then go for Eid get-together and visits to friends and relatives. It is forbidden to perform an optional fast during Eid 
because it is a time for relaxation. A typical greeting on this occasion is Eid Mubarak or Blessed Eid. Narrated by Abu Huraira, the Prophet peace be upon him said, The end of Ramadan is on the day when you end it, and the Eid festival of sacrifice is on the day when you sacrifice. The whole of Arafah is the place of staying, and the whole of Mina is the place of sacrifice, and all the roads of Mecca are the place of sacrifice, and the whole of Musdalifa is the place of staying. Narrated by Anas ibn Malik, when the Apostle of Allah peace be upon him came to Medina, the people had two days on which they engaged in games. He asked, what are these two days? What is the significance? They said, we used to engage ourselves on them in the pre-Islamic period. The Apostle of Allah peace be upon him said, Allah has substituted for them something better than them the day of sacrifice and the day of breaking of fast. Narrated by Anas ibn Malik, Allah's Messenger peace be upon him said that when Laylatul Qadr comes, Gabriel descends with a company of angels who invoke blessings on everyone who is standing or sitting and remembering Allah who is great and glorious. Then when their festival, day comes, that is the day when they break their fast, Allah speaks proudly of them to his angels, saying, My angels, what is the reward of a hired servant who has fully accomplished his work? They reply, Our Lord, his reward is that he should be paid his wage in full. He says, My angels, my male and female servants have fulfilled what I have made obligatory for them, and then have come out raising their voices in supplication. By my might, glory, honor, high dignity and exalted station, I shall certainly answer them. Then he says, Return, for I have forgiven you and changed your evil deeds into good deeds. He said that they then returned, having received forgiveness. Narrated by Ibn Abbas, the Prophet, peace be upon him, went out for the Eid prayer on the Eid day and offered a two rakat prayer and he neither offered a prayer before it or after it. Then he went toward the woman along with Bilal. He preached them and ordered them to give in charity, and some amongst the women started giving their forearm bangles and earrings. Narrated by Ibn Abbas, I am a witness that Allah's Apostle, peace be upon him, offered the Eid prayer before delivering the sermon, and then he thought that the woman would not be able to hear him because of the distance. So he went to them along with Bilal, who was spreading his garment. The Prophet, peace be upon him, advised and ordered them to give in charity. So the woman started giving their ornaments in charity. Narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah, on a festival day, when I was present at the prayer along with the Prophet peace be upon him, he first observed the prayer without adhan or iqama before the sermon. Then, when he had finished the prayer, he stood up leaning on Bilal, praised and extolled Allah, gave the people an exhortation and an admonition, and urged them to obey him. He then went to the woman, taking Bilal with him, commanded them to fear Allah, and gave them an exhortation and an admonition.
narrated by Anas bin Malik, Allah's apostle peace be upon him never proceeded for the prayer on the day of Eid al-Fitr unless he had eaten some dates. Anas also narrated the Prophet used to eat odd number of dates. <laughs> Narrated by Abu Huraira, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, went out by one road on the festival day, he returned by another. Narrated by Aisha, that once Abu Bakr came to her on the day of Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha, while the Prophet was with her, and there were two girl singers with her, singing songs of the Ansar about the day of Boath. Abu Bakr said twice, Musical instrument of Satan. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Leave them, Abu Bakr, for every nation has an Eid that is festival, and this day is our Eid. <laughs> Narrated by Aisha, it was the day of Eid, and the black people were plaguing with shields and spears. So either I requested the Prophet peace be upon him, or he asked me whether I would like to see the display. I replied in the affirmative. Then the Prophet peace be upon him made me stand behind him, and my cheek was torching his cheek, and he was saying, Carry on, O Bani Arfida. Till I got tired, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked me, Are you satisfied? I replied in the affirmative, and he told me to leave. <laughs> Narrated by Qaza Mawla, the freed slave of Ziyad, I heard Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrating four things from the Prophet, and I appreciated them very much. He said, conveying the words of the Prophet, A woman should not go on a two-day journey except with her husband or a mahram. No fasting is permissible on two days, that is Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. No prayer after two prayers, that is after the Fajr prayer till the sun rises, and after the Asr prayer till the sun sets. Do not prepare yourself for a journey except to three mosques, that is, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Mecca, the Mosque of Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem, and my mosque, Medina. Narrated by Ibn Umar, Allah's Apostle, peace be upon him, enjoined the payment of one sa'a of dates or one sa'a of bali as zakat al-fitr on every Muslim, slave or free, male or female, young or old, and he ordered that it be paid before the people went out to offer the aid prayer. <laughs> Abdul Rahman bin Auf. He was one of the first eight persons to accept Islam. He was one of the ten persons Al Ashratul Mubashiri Nabil Jannah who were assured of entering paradise. He was one of the six persons chosen by Umar to form the Council of Shura to choose the Khalifa after his death. His name in Jahiliya days was Abu Amr, but when he accepted Islam, the noble prophet called him Abdul Rahman, the servant of the beneficent God. Abdul Rahman became a Muslim before the prophet entered the house of Al Arqam. In fact, it is said that he accepted Islam only days after Abu Bakr as Siddiq did so. Abdul Rahman did not escape the punishment which the early Muslims suffered at the hands of the Quraysh. He bore this punishment with steadfastness, as they did. He remained firm, as they did. 
And when they were compelled to leave Mecca for Abyssinia because of the continuous and unbearable persecution, Abdul Rahman also went. He returned to Mecca when it was rumored that conditions for the Muslims had improved. But when these rumors proved to be false, he left again for Abyssinia on a second Hijra. From Mecca once again he made the Hijra to Medina. Soon after arriving in Medina, the Prophet peace be upon him in his unique manner began pairing off the Muhajirin and the Ansar. This established a firm bond of brotherhood and was meant to strengthen social cohesion and ease the destitution of the Muhajirin. Abdul Rahman was linked by the Prophet with Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a. Sa'ad in the spirit of generosity and magnanimity with, with which the Ansar greeted the Muhajirin said to Abdul Rahman, My brother, among the people of Medina, I have the most wealth. I have two orchids and I have two wives. See which of the two orchids you like and I shall vacate it for you and which of my two wives is pleasing to you and I will divorce her for you. Abdul Rahman must have been embarrassed and said in reply, May God bless you in your family and your wealth, but just show me where the marketplace is. Abdul Rahman went to the marketplace and began trading with whatever little resources he had. He bought and sold and his profits grew rapidly. Soon he was sufficiently well off and was able to get married. He went to the noble prophet with the scent of perfume lingering over him. Mahyan o Abdul Rahman has claimed the prophet. Mahyan being a word of Yemeni origin which indicates pleas and surprise. I have got married, replied Abdul Rahman. And what did you give your wife as Mahar? I have got married, replied Abdul Rahman. And what did you give your wife as Mahar? The weight of Anwat in gold. You must have a Walima wedding feast, even if it is with a single sheep. And may Allah bless you in your wealth, said the Prophet with obvious pleasure and encouragement. Thereafter, Abdul Rahman grew so accustomed to business success that he said if he lifted a stone, he expected to find gold or silver under it. Abdul Rahman distinguished himself in both the battles of Badr and Uhud. At Uhud, he remained firm throughout and suffered more than 20 wounds some of them deep and severe. Even so, his physical jihad was matched by his jihad with his wealth. Once the Prophet, may God bless him and grant him peace, was preparing to dispatch an expeditionary force. He summoned his companions and said, Contribute Sadaqa, for I want to dispatch an expedition. Abdul Rahman went to his house and quickly returned. O Messenger of God, he said, I have 4,000 dinars. I give 2,000 as a card to my Lord, and 2,000 I leave for my family. When the Prophet decided to send an expedition to distant Tabuk, this was the last Ghazwa, that is, battle of his life, that he mounted. His need for finance and material was not greater than his need for men for the Byzantine forces were a numerous and well equipped for. That year in Medina was one of the drought and hardship. The journey to Tabuk was long, more than a thousand kilometers. Provisions were in short supply. Transport was at premium, so much so that a group of Muslims came to the Prophet pleading to go with him, but he had to turn them away because he could find no transport for them. These men were sad and dejected and came to be known as the Baqa'in, or the weepers, and the army itself was called the army of hardship. Thereupon the Prophet called upon his companions to give generously for the war effort in the path of God and assured them they would be rewarded. The Muslims' response to the Prophet's call was immediate and generous. In the forefront of those who responded, was Abdul Rahman bin Auf. He donated 200 awqiyah of gold 
Whereupon Umar bin al-Khattab said to the Prophet, I have now seen Abdul Rahman committing a wrong. He has not left anything for his family. Have you left anything for your family, Abdul Rahman? asked the Prophet. Yes, replied Abdul Rahman. I have left for them more than what I give and better. How much? inquired the Prophet. What God and his messenger have promised of sustenance, goodness and reward, replied Abdul Rahman. The Muslim's army eventually left for Tabuk. There Abdul Rahman was blessed with an honor which was not conferred on anyone till then. The time of Salat came and the Prophet peace be upon him was not there at the time. The Muslims chose Abdul Rahman as their Imam. The first record of the Salat was almost completed when the Prophet, may God bless him and grant him peace, joined the worshippers and performed the Salat behind Abdul Rahman bin Auf. Could there be a greater honor conferred on anyone than to have been the Imam of the most honored of God's creation, the Imam of the Prophet, the Imam of Muhammad, the Messenger of God? When the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away, Abdul Rahman took on the responsibility of looking after the needs of his family, the Ummahat al Mu'mineen. He would go with them wherever they wanted to and he even performed Hajj with them to ensure that all their needs were met. This is a sign of the trust and confidence which he enjoyed on the part of the Prophet's family. Abdul Rahman's support for the Muslims and the Prophet's wives in particular was well known. Once, he sold a piece of land for 40,000 dinars and he distributed the entire amount among the Banu Zahra the relatives of the Prophet's mother, Amina, the poor among the Muslims and the Prophet's wives. When Aisha, may God be pleased with her, received some of his money, she asked, Who has sent this money? And it was told it was Abdul Rahman. Whereupon she said, The Messenger of God, may God bless him and grant him peace, said, No one will feel compassion towards you after I die except the Sabirin those who are patient and resolute. The prayer of the noble prophet that Allah should bestow barakah on the wealth of Abdul Rahman appeared to be with Abdul Rahman throughout his life. He became the richest man among the companions of the prophet. His business transactions invariably met with success and his wealth continued to grow. His trading caravans to and from Medina grew larger and larger, bringing to the people of Medina wheat, flour, butter, clothes, utensils, perfume, and whatever else was needed, and exporting whatever surplus produce they had. One day, a loud rumbling sound was heard coming from beyond the boundaries of Medina, normally a calm and peaceful city. The rumbling sound gradually increased in volume. In addition, clouds of dust and sand were tied up and blown into the wind. The people of Medina soon realized that a mighty caravan was entering the city. They stood in amazement as 700 camels laden with goods moved into the city and crowded the streets. There was much shouting and excitement as people called to one another to come out and witness the sight and see what goods and sustenance the camel caravan had brought. Aisha, may God be pleased with her, had the commotion and asked, What is this that's happening in Medina? And she was told, It is the caravan of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, which has come from Syria bearing his merchandise. A caravan making all this commotion, 
she asked in disbelief. Yes, O Umm al Mu'mineen, there are seven hundred camels. Aisha shook her head and gazed in the distance as if she was trying to recall some scene or utterance of the past, and then she said, I have heard the Messenger of God, may God bless him and grant him peace, say, I have seen Abdurrahman bin Auf entering paradise creeping. Why creeping? Why should he not enter paradise leaping and at a quick pace with the early companions of the Prophet? Allah.